Okay, students, welcome to Texas History 2301, and this lecture is going to cover uh, the Texas Revolution. It is the last lecture of Unit 1. Today is September 16th, 2020, in the year of COVID, and this is not going to be as detailed a lecture as the other ones were, okay, uh, because of the reasons being that the Texas Revolution is extremely convoluted uh, and it's uh, really uh, the way that we were taught the Texas Revolution was not really the honest and correct way I'm sorry of them teaching us the Texas Revolution because the Texas Revolution um, was actually about maybe four separate revolutions going on at one time with every single member of the involved in the Texas Revolution uh, uh, having their own idea of how the revolution should be fought. Uh, so that in itself is, is creates a lot of commotion and a lot of confusion. And like I said before, I believe the Texas Revolution began at Fredonia. Okay? Sorry about my yawning there. Okay, I'm back. I bet you all didn't even know I was gone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I had to go get some iced coffee to keep my throat cleared. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is the concern of American immigration by a general inspector by the name of Manuel Mier y Terran. Okay? Now, uh, Terran, as we say it, or Terran, it doesn't have two R's, so it's just Terran. Teran uh, was sent to investigate, and they would call them inspector generals, right? And he was sent to inspect after the Fredonia incident. He's alarmed. He comes to Texas and he says, holy crap. You know, these uh, Anglo-Americans have no regard for immigration laws. They have no regard for anti-slavery laws. Uh, under no circumstances uh, uh, are they following any of the rules that they're supposed to and he says like you know these concerns are incredibly valid these concerns are incredibly valid and what needs to be done is that we need to look at these immigration laws again okay now with that said we will look and see that there will be some special concessions made by the Mexican government who were allowed to expand some of this territory because they were exporting cotton and they were paying taxes and that was helping the Mexican government. And that's why they were going to uh, be lenient uh, towards the, um, the, or there was going to be some leniency towards slavery because of the cotton. And remember uh, that the Federalists felt that Slavery was needed in efforts to put land into production, okay? Now, the centralists, the conservatives, deplored slavery. They wanted it abolished. It's going to get abolished in 1821 in Mexico. But what happens is, is that these people come under the guise of indentured servants, okay? Now, the other thing that we're going to look at is that we're at this time, we're going to see the rise of Jim Bowie. And Jim Bowie was a trader. He actually used to buy slaves from Lafitte, Jean Lafitte, and then march them up to uh, New Orleans, okay, from Galveston, march them up to New Orleans. And in New Orleans, he would surrender the slaves to uh, immigration officials and then buy them at an auction the next day and they bring them back to Texas and sell them. Now him and his brother did that. They'd buy 40 or 50 slaves. Now can you imagine how mean they were that people, that these slaves wouldn't rebel against them? He had to have been a real SOB. Uh, Jim Bowie was a character, okay? He was a murderer uh, and uh, uh, he was an opportunist. And later on he's going to uh, marry into the Veramendi family in San Antonio uh, and actually clean up his name some and become part of that prominent Mexican family 
uh, which were actually the Vermendis were some of the original uh, San Antonioans or Bejaranos as we call them that came from uh, uh, the Canary Islands they were known as Canarios so these people were very very high stock uh, unfortunately for Jim Bowie there is a cholera epidemic in San Antonio and his wife gets cholera he sends her to Saltillo and she dies on the way there the way that they would get cholera epidemics in San Antonio is because uh, they would go ahead and use the San Antonio River for disposing of fecal matter and dead animals and all the above and then they would draw their drinking water out of the out of there and not boil it so they would get cholera and of course when you get cholera uh, you die of dehydration uh, via uh, diarrhea okay by the time of the Alamo Jim Bowie is suffering of course from depression of the loss of his wife and he is suffering from tuberculosis and is at you know a death now and I firmly believe that you know he was looking for a place to die when he dies at the Alamo okay and we'll talk a little bit more about Jim Bowie but you know he was not a nice character okay under no circumstances was he anybody that I'd like to hang around and um, have a few beers with now what you begin to have is that you're going to have different incidents like the Velasco uh, the undeclared Texas Revolution beginning with Velasco and what happens here is that the centralist government takes over Mexico and declares all of the empresario contracts null and void both Anglo and Mexican you had De Leon De, Leon de Zavala to name a few uh, and Austin and DeWitt are exempt because they each had brought in a uh, uh, hundred families but you know there's still a lot of issues now it also added that new settlers could not settle along the US border which means that they could not settle along Louisiana and then what they do is this is a lot like they did in the American Revolution with the quartering act is that Mexico begins to populate its presidios next to the missions with convicts who had exchanged uh, freedom for military service okay garrisons in San Antonio, Goliac, Anahuad, Nacogdoches are refortified making a bigger Mexican presence and in addition to that most Texas settlements who were politically federalist are alarmed uh, but are really upset when the Coahuila at Texas Conf uh, Congress expels their delegates so at this time what we're gonna have is that we're gonna have a, a two facet you know two strains from the Texas you're gonna have the war party who's gonna have people like Bowie Mills William Barrett Travis and the Wharton brothers to name a few and then the other ones that are going to remain centralist I mean federalist are gonna side with Austin that they don't want to go to war now one of the things that Mexico does and this is very foolish there was this mercenary by the name of William David Bradburn Juan Davis Bradburn uh, and uh, he really liked the military life so he goes to Mexico and he pretty much offers his service to Mexico he was all about Mexico love Mexico love the Mexican military Mexico found that they could use him so that he is a colonel at the time I don't think he becomes a general okay and he is sent to deal with the illegal slave and to deal with uh, the war party and to collect taxes and the Mexicans feel like well he's a white guy you know of course we're not gonna have any issues that we send him now what he does is that he is very iron-fisted he does not take no for an answer and in a situation where he is dealing with two runaway slaves uh, that belong to Bowie if I'm not mistaken 
Travis tries to secure the slaves uh, uh, from Bradburn and of course Bradburn jails him and at this part at this point they demand the release of Travis and Bradburn refuses a skirmish ensues there's no success and at that time the war party writes the Turtle Bayou resolutions claiming that they're not traitors but dissatisfied with Bradburn and the centralist government and that they want the rights given to them under the Constitution of 1824, okay, which I believe is the first real Texas flag, the flag of 1824. Now, at this time, most Texans favored Santa Ana because he was pro-federalist, but later on, what Santa Ana is going to do is that he is going to flip-flop and become a centralist and become a dictator, and that's how he makes his way to the Alamo. Now, what you're going to have here is that most of these cities, like, for example, in Brazoria, they had a cannon, and um, Bradburn wants it. He sends uh, another colonel by the name of Domingo Ugartechea to pick it up. Um, Ugartechea goes to get it. There is a skirmish. Ugartechea runs out of uh, ammunition, and uh, he surrenders. Casualties are pretty much even. Texans lose seven, Mexicans lose five. Ogartecha surrenders his force, his sword at uh, at uh, Velasco, and he is allowed to leave. Uh, uh, now, what happens here is that the events at Anahuac and the events at Velasco uh, are going to cause other. Texans under Austin to form a peace party. They said, like, you know what? We don't want to fight. We don't want any of this. It's kind of like the Olive Branch petition, okay? Now, meanwhile, in Mexico, Santa Ana is elected as a Federalist, and there is a chasm between men like Stephen F. Austin and David G. Burnett, okay? And Bowie, you know? Houston is going to come into the picture here pretty soon. And what he wants, what Houston wants, is that he wants Andrew Jackson to dispute Indian claims. Because he was very sympathetic to the Indians, and he had been, he was married to an Indian. So what happens that in 1833 at San Felipe de Austin, uh, the settlers uh, want political autonomy. They want the repeal of the immigration law of 1830. And they want separate statehood for Coahuila. They want Texas and Coahuila to be separated. Now, Austin travels to Mexico City, um, and he meets with President Valentin Gomez Farias. And after much negotiation, they reverse, partially reverse, the immigration law of 1830. And Anglo settlers are allowed to return to Coahuila and Texas. So we have immigration here again. Oh, many Mexican officials refuse to support. Mexican autonomy. They felt that if they did, it was going to be attack on the Mexican aristocracy and the church, right? Because it's liberal, the liberals were also felt that anything like that would be attack on the church. And remember, they use the church. The church is very strong in Mexico. There is no separation of church and state in Mexico, even this time. The state uh, religion is Catholicism, okay? Now, while all this is going on with Valentin Gomez Farias, Santa Ana has kind of gone back to his uh, plantation and is checking this political climate, and in 34 he comes back to power and approved changes for the immigration law of 1830. And when he approves the changes to the uh, immigration law of 1830, Austin uh, is jailed uh, under is put under house arrest because they don't know exactly what's going to happen and this is why Austin ends up missing the Texas Revolution he's in jail uh, he's not released until 1835 okay so this is uh, Santa Ana comes back in 34 uh, and then he's released in 35 
you know, um, so there is going to be some missing there. Uh, now, even with Austin in uh, uh, under house arrest, Texas does flourish. And what we're going to have here is we're going to have a period of relative tranquility and then Santa Ana is going to, of course, flip everything upside down. Demographics of Texas at this time, real quick. Irish, Polish, Germans, Czechoslovakian, and English settlers. We have the further demise of Mexican Americans and the increase of slaves. And there are some landowning Hispanics. Zavala, Navarro, Seguin, Martin de Leon. You, have, you do have those people that are still there. Now, what happens here is that after testing the political climate uh, right around September of 1835 uh, Santa Ana decides that he is not ready that Mexico is not ready for a democracy so he stages a military coup overthrows the constitution of 1824 and becomes a dictator okay uh, rebellions ensue in, in, in southern Mexico and in northern Mexico, okay, in Zacatecas, Sonora, Chihuahua, Coahuila, and of course Texas, Coahuila y Texas. Now, many of these northern and southern provinces felt that they had been betrayed. His, his support was in central Mexico. In southern Mexico, where you have more Maya, more indigenous and Nahua people, they did not support him. And of course, in the north, where it was very sparsely populated, they did not support him either. Ironically, when the Mexican Revolution of 1910 begins, it begins again in the north and in the south. Uh, Pancho Villa, Venustiano Carranza, and Francisco Madero were from the northern states, and Emiliano Zapata was from a southern state. You do not have that many people from the middle of or the center of, of Mexico. Okay, he starts off with the really thing that starts the revolution is las las siete leyes, the seven laws, and this is really a kick in the teeth to the settlers. Okay, this is Santana has taken it too far. Uh, Santana is one of my favorite historical figures because he's kind of like a chameleon that can weave in and out of situations. And more importantly, he outlives all of his contemporaries. You know, you're thinking that he's going to get shot, but he never does. He actually dies of cholera in Mexico City. Uh, okay, he, he, first thing he does, he abolishes the compromise of the Constitution of 1824, which is a bad thing. Uh, one of the things that if I have any Texas fanatics or any of you that are going to become Texas, uh, Texas history teachers, Make sure that you buy a flag of the Constitution of 1824, or flag of 1824. Uh, a lot of people do fly that flag in Texas during the month of April, uh, you know, because that is, you know, when the revolution, the Texas Revolution comes to a head. So it is, it is important. You know, I fly it in all of April, or, you know, sometimes even in March, you know, start in March and go all the way through April and fly the flag of 1824. Most people don't know that. Now, Santa Ana is very heavy-handed. Uh, one of the primary issues of the revolution is this heavy-handedness. But it is erroneous to put full blame on Santa Ana. Okay? Like many Texas historians kind of put him as the scum of the earth. Let's, let's get with a deal that Anglo Texans were not adhering to the to the deal that they had made, and they didn't like taxation. Okay, but you gotta you gotta pay taxes to uh, bu uh, build infrastructure. Okay, uh, the other thing is the distance from Mexico. Okay, and the space between Mexico City and you know San Antonio, and the time to travel, and there's no people there. The population density is very small. And then, of course, you're going to have ethnocentrism or racism, anti-Catholic sentiment, anti-government, and pro-slavery attitudes. All right? Those very conservative values that they're very deeply uh, 
Protestant. They're very anti-government, and they are pro-slave. Okay. Now the People's Army, uh, the People's Revolutionary Army, uh, uh, or the Texas Revolutionary Army, uh, is kind of like a assembly of ragtag groups. You know, some people follow Bowie, some people follow Travis, some people follow Fannin, some people follow uh, Houston. But at the end of the day, if anybody tells you that it was a completely fluid event, well-greased machine, uh, they're lying to you, okay? They, they, they were. You know, I mean, the disturbances at Anahuac and Fredonia were the precursors. Uh, as I said, the Texi Texian army was ragtag, uh, bent on Jacksonian democracy. They chose their own officers despite qualification. It was like a popula popularity contest. Who's in charge? Was it Houston? Was it Austin? Was it Collinsworth? Why wasn't Austin in charge? I mean, Austin was the one that started it all. Why was Houston in charge? Probably because he had the, the gave everybody the lip service and put himself, you know, and, you know, got the favor of Bowie and everybody else. I mean, Fannin uh, never really listens to Houston, and it's because he didn't listen to Houston that Fannin gets 300 men killed at Goliad. Uh, who was the sitting president? Was it Burnett? You know, I mean, we've got all these, we have all these threads, you know. Now, what we do see here is the birth of Texas nationalism, that it gives us that don't mess with Texas attitude, okay? Now, what's going to happen is going to be the, the spark here that, you know, that's really going to get everything going. It's going to be the Battle of Gonzalez. You know, the whole come and take it, right? They basically, Ugartechea is sent to retrieve a brass cannon at Goliad. And he sends five privates that are arrested by the name, uh, by a guy named of and Andrew Ponton, okay? I used to say Pontoon, but maybe it is Pontoon, but it, it only has one in El Ponton. Now, Ugartechea says, you know, I really don't want to get involved in this, so I'm going to send, you know, Teniente Castañeda, Lieutenant Castañeda, to take it by force if needed. Well, when they get there, the Gonzalez River is flooded, and if you ever go to Gonzalez as you get there, you come over a hill if you're coming from the north where they were coming from, from like east, from west, from San Antonio, right? And the river was flooded, and while it's flooded they the the volunteer army the gonzalez volunteer army relocates and somebody stitches a flag together that's come and take it flag all right which means come and take the cannon now a battle ensues nobody really gets i mean there's not a lot of people getting hurt castañeda meets with commander john henry moore who tells castañeda we're going to keep the cannon because we're going to use it against Santa Ana. Castañeda says, you know what? I don't like Santa Ana either, but I need to follow orders, man. So cut me some slack. Now, Moore tells Castañeda, the only thing that's going to happen is that you're going to get some more of your men killed. So Castañeda says, screw it. This is above my pay grade. I'm leaving. So the Battle of Gonzales is automatically going to start the Texas Revolution. When Santa Ana finds out about this, he is furious. Now what happens to the cannon? <laughs> From what I understand, the cannon is taken back and they were going to hide it. And it falls into a creek. And then it rains the night after it falls into a creek. And they're unable to get it out. Okay, so the cannon is lost. Now, here's the deal. You've got a guy by the name of Martin Perfecto de Cos in San Antonio. And what's going to happen is because of his incompetence and because he really doesn't want to be doing any of this, he's only doing it because he's Santa Ana's brother-in-law, is that Bowie is going to kick de Cos out of San, of San Antonio and send him back to Mexico. He says, give me your sword and get the hell out of here. So Bowie says, okay, I've gotten rid of Martin Perfecto de Cos 
And that's when you begin to see people assemble at the Alamo. But everybody thinks that they're just going to fortify San Antonio. They don't know that Santa Ana is on his way, you know. Um, so what happens here is that you'll see a string of events, okay. You're going to have um, a battle in Goliad. And then, you know, Austin is back now. He is chosen as a commander of the volunteers. Now, all eyes are in San Antonio. Why? Because that's where all roads meet at the time. All right? Bowie, under Austin's command, defeats 400 Mexican forces at uh, Concepcion in 1835. And then, because of his lack of aggressiveness, Austin is replaced as commander by Colonel Edward Burleson. Ed Burleson was not a nice person. Okay? Now, 1835, November of 1835, you have the grass fight. And the grass was real tall there. And Santa Ana leaves to Mexico in order to deal with the rebels. Okay? Now, the Texians continue their assault throughout Texas and on San Antonio. And I remember San Antonio is under the command of Decos and Ugartechea. And after a lengthy siege, as I told you before, they send uh, the Mexicans, they parole them, and they send Ugartechea and the coast back to Mexico and parole them and say, never come back. All right? Ever, ever come back. We don't ever want to see you here again. Surrenders his sword, and he says, okay, we're not coming back. Now, here's when it's going to get kind of tricky, and this will show you that everything is just like going everywhere. Texas Governor Henry Smith all of a sudden decides that he wants to attack Matamoros. That's where Brownsville is. He's afraid that Mexican forces are going to come in that way. And there are Mexican forces coming in that way. Right? They either come in through Del Rio, El Paso, Laredo, a little bit above Laredo, or Matamoros, right? He says, you know what? He tells Houston, I want you to go to Matamoros. Houston is like, yeah, I really don't want to go to Matamoros. So he tells Bowie to go to Matamoros. And Bowie's like, yeah, I really don't want to go to Matamoros. You know, I'm going to go ahead and stall. But I really don't want to go to Matamoros. In this time that this is going on, December 30th, Mexico issues a decree that all men involved in the Texas Revolt will be shot as traitors and pirates. Okay? January 1836. Okay, we're on the on the downslope. Bowie's inability to follow orders causes so much confusion that nobody knows what's going on. You know, it's like but why don't you send Fannin to Matamoros? So Fannin says, I, I, don't, I don't want to go to Matamoros. And to make matters worse, Fannin then is giving the order to go to Matamoros, and he says, I don't want to go to Matamoros. All right? Now, there is a force coming in from Matamoros under a very competent general that would have annihilated these Texas forces. You know, it would have, it would have changed the... The way the war would have, uh, the re revolution would have ended. Now, what happens is that Houston becomes very frustrated with the inactivity of Fannin and Bowie, and he orders Fannin back to Goliad, and then he's going to ask him to come back to Washington on the Brazos. And again, Fannin is not going to do as he is ordered to do, and that's what's
what should have happened after the Battle of Harrisburg or the skirmish at Harrisburg is that Santa Ana should have waited there and waited for reinforcements. And then, after that, he could have moved to Buffalo Bayou. But instead, he moves his exhausted troops to Buffalo Bayou and they camp. Now, if you go there, there's a knoll, there's a hill, and you can't see on the other side. So the Texian army was just on the other side. Now, Houston doesn't want to fight. They defy his orders, and cavalry scouts spot Santa Ana's army and attack while the Mexicans are taking a nap. And what you have here is in a matter of minutes, it's over. Now, the killing continues for hours. Okay. Uh, Santa Ana is captured and used as leverage, but Mexico loses a lot of its vanguard troops and a lot of its really good generals, like General Castrillon, who actually some of the Texian generals and colonels try to save him, but nobody listens and they kill him. Castrillon is actually buried there on the battlefield. It's a great general. Okay, he was a good man. Uh, now, the remaining Mexican troops uh, uh, that are not at San Jacinto, that are under Urrea and General Filisola, meet at Elizabeth Powell's Tavern and decide to retreat south of the Colorado River. They can still beat the, the Texian army, but they say, you know what, I don't want to be here, you don't want to be here, so why don't we let these people just keep this, you know? May 14th, the Treaty of Velasco is signed. Um, and Santa Ana uh, signs it and the Treaty of uh, Velasco is signed and the Texas Revolution is over. June the 4th, 1836, Juan Seguin retakes the Alamo in San Antonio without a shot fired. And June the 15th of 1836, a, de a defeated, exhausted, and demoralized Mexican army crosses the Rio Grande at Matamoros into Mexico and Santa Ana is sent to Washington to meet with Andrew Jackson, okay? And then after that, Andrew Jackson sends him back to Mexico. Now, I suggest that you watch a couple of video clips on the Texas Revolution. John Green has some really good ones under expansionism. Watch those. I'm not going to ask you a lot, a lot, a lot of really deep questions about the revolution you have to know who these men are and you have to know that they were undecided that they were they are at the end of the day a ragtag group of individuals they were not the vanguard mexican troops in all of its splendor whose fault was it it was santa ana's fault right santa ana could have waited until he got his ten and a half uh uh, 11 pound cannons and he wouldn't have he would not have used any men he would have waited at Harrisburg and attacked another day then he could have pushed those troops out of Texas and gotten control of Texas again but I think that independence was inevitable the problem here was the same problem that we're going to have on the Oregon territory that any time that you allow Anglo Anglo-Americans or Anglos to settle areas, they're going to keep it for themselves. Obviously they did it in the colonies, they did it in Kentucky, they did it in Tennessee, uh, they did it in California, they did it in Oregon, you know, so we need to be careful, you know, because they'll, they'll take it, you know, I mean, you and you can't tell people come here and work the land and improve it and then tell them that they have to leave. There's got to be some consistency there. There was a lot of inconsistencies by the Mexican government, and there was a lot of tenacity from the Texans also. So I, I think that there is no single blame here. You know, they should have listened to Manuel Mieri Terran and come up with some more sensible immigration legislation. But then again, Mexico City and, and San Antonio are too far apart. It, 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 it's very hard to govern, especially... At, at that day and age even today the northern provinces of mexico are very autonomous of actual mexico those of you that know that that those of you that are from tamaulipas nuevo leon coahuila and sonora baja california you know that you're not beholden to uh 
to Mexico City. Even places like Zacatecas are still pretty considered pretty far away. All right, so uh, I, this lecture is concluded. Remember that these views are mine and not those of TCC South Campus. Uh, if you find anything wrong with these lectures, make sure that you send me a, a, a notice and tell me what you want me to fix or tell me what I miss. But please, I hope that they help. And in addition to that, you're welcome to use them for your children or for somebody that wants a basic uh, you know, a, opinion of the, the Texas Revolution through my eyes and through my research, okay? You all take care, be kind to each other, and wear your masks. Bye-bye.